Well, let me greet everybody and uh, welcome back. And I hope you're having a good evening. It's a beautiful morning actually here in Pennsylvania. Um, and a little uh, cool, but not as cool as it typically is in November. And uh, so a beautiful morning. And um, so glad that uh, we can join together uh, like this and uh, continue our study uh, in the book, uh, Winning the War to Walk Worthy. So, uh, so we'll uh, pray and then we'll just uh, get started here. So let's pray uh, together. Father, we do bow before you and acknowledge that without your Without the help of your spirit and apart from our union with your son, we cannot do anything. And we pray that you would be our help even uh, today uh, in this study, and that what we do would be uh, helpful and pleasing to you and in line with your word. And Lord, help us most of all to live, uh, to live your word and to do uh, what we know is in your word. And so Lord, we just pray for your blessing now on our time together in Jesus name, amen. Well, let's begin by looking at Ephesians six and uh, let me read through these verses and let's get these verses in our mind and we'll make a few comments as we go. And uh, we've been able to work our way down through a number of verses and uh, so hopefully as we read, things are a little more clear uh, than they were before we started our study. That would be the goal. And then as things become clear, then it's easier for us to obey and to make application. So we, of course, are looking at this, uh, really the final, the final section in Paul's letter to the Ephesian uh, believers. And uh, some of you were with us when we were in Ephesus. You may remember walking uh, down the street, looking at the library of Celsus and some of the various remains of temples. These are the people to whom Paul was writing these words. And he's writing these words at the end of um, a number of paragraphs where he is uh, exhorting them to walk in a certain way because of the calling they have in Christ as a members of the body of Christ. Uh, he is now uh, urging them to conduct themselves in a certain way. And as he brings that exhortation uh, to a close, he switches to the use of uh, military imagery in order to really um, encourage them to walk worthy. And of course, we're calling this winning the war to walk worthy. And as we've looked at these verses, what we've noted is that there are three major commands, what I've called a three pronged strategy to winning the war to walk worthy. The first of these is in verse 10, where he says, finally, my brethren, he's addressing Christian people, be strong or be strengthened by the Lord and specifically in the power of his might. Paul started off Ephesians by talking about the mighty power of God at work in Christ and then at work in those who believe. And he ends his epistle by calling us right back to that power. Uh, there is uh, no help for us uh, apart from the infinite power of God at work in our behalf. Then verse 11, put on, and this is the second command, put on the whole armor of God. And this is a command that he will repeat in verse 13. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able, and here's the purpose, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, to stand firm, to not back down from anything Christ intended for his body. That you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes or methods of the devil for we do not wrestle, we wrestle not. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against, and here are four uh, different um echelons, hierarchies of, 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 of evil spirits against principalities, those that 
uh, are first in rank against powers, those who have authority, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places, spiritual referring to their nature. They are spirits. They do not have the limitations of flesh and blood. Wherefore, he repeats the same command again, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand, to stand against in the evil day, even the worst of times, the worst of uh, circumstances, and having done all to stand. And then verse 14, stand therefore. And this really begins the third section in this passage that's going to take us all the way at least through verse 18. Stand therefore. So being strengthened by the Lord's might, uh, put on the whole armor of God, put on that new man that we have in Christ Jesus that was created. It took a, it's really on the level of creation, this new nature, this new man that we can now live out. Now, having put that on, stand, having your loins, and now he's going to specify six different things, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation, I like the word readiness, of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying, and this is attached. Notice there's no period at the end of verse 17. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And some of you have heard me speak on the subject of battle praying. And if we have opportunity, we'll eventually get to verse 18, but we'll see. So last time, let me just review what we did last time. We talked about two important things last time, and I'll uh, put some of this in the, uh, in the chat uh, here. But uh, we talked about a couple important things last time, and that was related to the imagery of the armor. And the point we made last time is that obviously, when he uses uh, words like whole armor, words like breastplate, um, he's using imagery. And we want to make sure that we unpack that imagery, or we could say this, we'll make sure that we make uh, the focus, not the imagery, as much as what that image is, is picturing. And I think this is important as we get down now here to verse 14, and you've got your loin skirt about to the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. It's important, as we mentioned last time, that we put our emphasis on the virtue uh, that is attached to it. For example, the belt of truth. Uh, we could talk about the belt, uh, the imagery is out of a belt, but the emphasis is truth. Same thing, breastplate. Uh, it's a breastplate of righteousness. And I mentioned last time, encouraged us as we read this to put the emphasis uh, in the right place, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the feet shod with the uh, preparation, uh, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and put the emphasis uh, where uh, where I believe uh, the Lord wants us to put the emphasis. The second thing we uh, talked about last time was what I called in the book, the nature of the armor. And this is where we got into uh, a, a kind of a more of a um, more, more teaching, but I think important is the difference between the subjective versus objective interpretations of what this armor is. And in order to, to solve that, we went back to some passages in Isaiah and a cross-reference in 1 Thessalonians. And the, the difference, if, just to remind us, the subjective interpretation is the idea that breastplate of righteousness, for example, or belt of truth would, uh, subjective would mean like our being truthful, our living out our righteousness, a shield of faith, uh, our uh, being faithful or are being filled with faith. The objective idea would be the idea that 
when we talk about truth, we mean God's truth, like maybe the word of God as the written body of truth. Uh, righteousness would be uh, the righteousness that was given to us uh, by Christ at the moment of salvation. The shield of faith would be the body of faith. Uh, helmet of salvation would be the salvation God, uh, God gave us. And I mentioned that you've got interpreters that are on both sides of the equation when it comes to subjective versus objective. But what we did is we went back and we looked at the at some of the passages where Paul gets this imagery. Paul is not the first. He did not invent this use of military imagery. Uh, he actually he actually is getting it from the book of 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 Isaiah. And when you go back to Isaiah, what you realize is that Isaiah is using this of Messiah. He's using it of Jehovah or Yahweh, and he's using the imagery of military equipment. Uh, he's using it in terms of their characteristics, what, what will characterize them. The Messiah will come, as it were, belted with truth. Um, Yahweh will come, and he will be clothed with vengeance and with righteousness and with zeal. These are the things that will characterize them in their coming. And then we looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter five, and this is where Paul mentions the, the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. And the reason I went through all these is because I think it's clear when you work through the biblical background uh, of, the, of these military pieces and you look at the cross references, what Paul has primarily in mind here is what we would term subjective, meaning what he's talking about is our putting on the new man in Christ. He's talking about our putting on truth. He's talking about our putting on righteous behavior. He's talking about our living faith-filled lives. He's talking about our living with a conscious hope of deliverance or hope of salvation. This is what Paul has in mind. And at the same time, I want to admit that this putting on the new man, this subjective living out of this new man we have in Christ, this is this cannot be separated in some ways from the from the objective side of this. The only reason I can I can live truthfully or speak truth is because I have a new man, a new nature that's been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now, the only reason I can live righteously is because I have been given the righteousness of Christ and Christ is at work in me. And so the subjective and objective go hand in hand, but we do want to put the emphasis where the apostle Paul is putting the emphasis. And his point here is, okay, God in Christ Jesus has put, has created in you a new man, a new nature, a new self, a new lifestyle. Now you've got to put that on like you would put on battle pieces for uh, as you engage in war, you've got to you've got to now put on that kind of behavior and you've got to live it. And part of his point is that our decision to live out really that new man, that that new lifestyle that was again created in us, that is armor for us in our in our Christian life. And we got to put that on. And so with that understanding, I want to move then into some of these next chapters in the book and the next verses in our passage. And what you've got is six pieces uh, of this whole armor of God that Paul singles out specifically. And you could number these if you wanted to in your Bible as you, as you read through. And I would encourage you again to make sure you highlight the virtue or the characteristic that is focused as you look at these verses. So for example, in verse 14, we've got the belt of, and here's the first one, truth. And then we've got the breastplate of righteousness. And then we've got third, your feet shod with the preparation. And I'm gonna put in parentheses here in the, in the chat, uh, the word readiness. And then we've got the shield of faith. And then we've got uh, number five, the helmet of salvation, or if I could borrow from Paul's other, other words in 1 Thessalonians 5, the hope of salvation, uh, our, our expectation of deliverance. And then you've got number six, you have the word, the word of God. And these are the pieces of the armor that Paul specifically 
uh, alludes to as he is encouraging the Ephesian believers to really put on this new man lifestyle that they have in Christ Jesus. So let's talk about this first one as we think about the belt of truth. And I'm going to just try to uh, go through some of these things quickly, but you could um, you could read through the chapters in the book, and you'll I, I'll develop it a little bit more uh, in those uh, chapters. So when we talk about the belt of truth, what we are uh, talking about is really um, being truthful. And this is not the first time in in Ephesians that Paul has encouraged uh, truthful behavior. If you think back to Ephesians four uh, twenty five. That's where he says, uh, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth uh, with his neighbor. So definitely part of uh, what Christ Jesus is doing in us is he is at work in us for us to be truthful in our behavior. Um, and in the book, I, I, I break down this idea of being truthful in two ways. Uh, being truthful, uh, number one, uh, in truthful in what we are and you can see in the chat there truthful in what we are and um, the idea of being sincere a a um, uh, what we are projecting is what we really are uh, we're not fake um, I like uh, a verse that I like with this regard comes from Joshua and it's I think it's Joshua 14 7 it's in the book and uh, but this goes back to Caleb, and uh, I love uh, Caleb's words uh, here when he says, He says, um, 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. And you know, as, as you look at that, what, what you see is Caleb. And the stand that he took, the 12 spies and the stand he took, uh, he took that stand sincerely. He wasn't just trying to be a different voice or trying to just, you know, uh, separate himself from the pack of others or somehow distinguish himself as a godly person. He brought back word or report as it was in his heart. Uh, he was the real deal. There was nothing fake about his stand and about his courage. And that's the idea of being truthful in what we are. Um, in fact, in, in, the, in First Timothy, it talks about deacons holding, the, holding truth with a clear conscience, a sincere believer. And so part of the belt of truth uh, is being truthful in what we are. And of course, we also think of it, secondly, truthful in what we, in what we say. And this is where we often uh, think more of, of being truthful, but truthful in what we say. And part of our new man behavior uh, is the willingness to always speak truth uh, in every relationship, in every circumstance, in a business, in a business context, um, in a in a political uh, context, in our relational uh, context. And there are lots of forms that lying can take. I think many of us would have come to the point where we, you know, we. Um, do not, uh, you know, by the, by the grace of God, we do not engage in outright lying. But there are, there are forms of lying or forms of deceit that uh, we can find ourselves in, um, exaggerating, um, fabricating, um, issuing empty threats. Uh, sometimes parents will issue empty threats to their children. You know, if you do that, um, you know, you will never ever you know, do something. Well, is that, do you mean that? Or is that just an, an empty threat? Um, cheating is a form of lying. Um, flattery, where you say things to somebody that really aren't true, but you're saying it uh, in order to enhance a relationship. Uh, gossip, uh, much of gossip is sometimes untrue. Um, uttering foolish promises, uh, betraying confidences, where you've said, you've said you've, you've given your word and you don't follow through, uh, making false excuses, um, 
you know, this can be even in marriage where sometimes a marriage partner will um, say things that aren't exactly true in order to manipulate the, in that relationship and, and make a point or get a point across. And they'll say something, they'll claim something that is not entirely true, maybe even a feeling that they claim to have that they really don't have. I mean, I'm just saying that, that, that lying can take all kinds of forms. And what we want to do is be truthful in what we are and in what we say. And this is what we learn from Christ. Christ is truth. And I love the way it is worded there in Ephesians 4, um, where it talks about, um, you have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him. This is verse 21 of chapter 4. And have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And it goes on in verse 24, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And if you look in the margin, like in my King James Bible, the holiness of truth. There's the word truth is in verse 24. And then, of course, verse 25, wherefore putting away lying, because we are members one of another. And so part of new man behavior, part of our armor in the war is just the absolute commitment that we will always speak truth, that we will endeavor to be truthful in what we are and truthful in what we say. And then if we can move on, we've got the second thing is this breastplate of righteousness. And when we talk about righteousness, obviously, again, we've got the idea that, um, and again, this is Ephesians 4, 24, the new man put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness. And so there, God has done a work in us. We've been given the righteousness of Christ. There's a new man that was created in Christ Jesus in righteousness. Righteous behavior, therefore, is something that should characterize us, and we should put that on. Um, you've probably heard this idea that the word righteous has the idea, and I'm going to put this in the chat here, of conformity to a standard. And if you take the word righteous back to its root idea, at least in the Old Testament, it's the idea of conforming to a standard. That would be something that is righteous. This could be a scale, for example, where you, where you weigh something or you measure something. Uh, you could have a righteous scale, meaning it's a scale that conforms to a standard. Uh, Job confesses his righteousness. Uh, and he goes through different areas in his life. And he says, okay, when it comes to the way I I treat my workers. Uh, I've conformed to a righteous standard. Uh, when it comes to uh, the God I worship and not looking at created objects like the sun or the moon, um, I've conformed to a righteous standard. Uh, when it comes to the way that I have treated my neighbor's wife, uh, I've conformed to a righteous standard. And he just goes through all the different areas in his life where he has conformed to a righteous standard. And so righteousness at, at its root is the idea of conformity to a standard, where there's a certain standard of behavior in different areas of our lives, and we try to conform to that standard. Well, what is that standard? Well, for us as believers, we are always trying to prove what is acceptable to the Lord. And there's a couple of cross-references that I would encourage us uh, to think about in this regard. And one of these would be, one of these is in Ephesians, Ephesians 5, and I'll put the reference here, uh, verses 8 through 10. And this is in a section related to being a child of light. And verse 8 says, walk as children of light. And then it says, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness. So there's our word. So this is one reason I'm referring to this passage, in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So it's saying, okay, so the fruit of the spirit or the fruit of a, of a child of light is, is goodness and righteousness and truth. Well, how do you assure that what you're doing is righteous? Well, verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And in order for us to demonstrate righteousness, we've always got to go back to this. What is acceptable to the Lord? What is acceptable in his eyes? And just because it's acceptable in our eyes does not mean it's acceptable in his eyes. And then you've got another passage that I was actually just reading this morning that I think is helpful also. And this is Philippians chapter 1, 
verses 9 through 11. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, you can see in verse 11, it, it, it uses the word righteousness, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. So the idea that we're actually filled with all the fruit that righteousness brings into our life. Well, how do you get there? Well, you got to start back in verse 9 of Paul, what he's praying for the Philippian believers. This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. He's not really praying in verse 9 that their love would abound in, uh, in quantity as much as in quality. Sometimes we, we stop after the word abound, that your love may abound. And we say, okay, I just need to love people more. I need to love God more. And that's true. But you got to keep reading verse 9. He's talking about the quality of their love, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That's, that's how their love needs to abound. In other words, he wants their love to grow in a discerning way so that they will love with more knowledge and they'll love with more, not, with more judgment, that they'll be more discerning in what they love, that um, they will love, if you could put it this way, that they will love things that matter. Well, why, does it, why is it important that we have a, a growingly discerning love? Verse 10, that you may approve things that are excellent. So again, here's this idea of proving, uh, proving things that are not just acceptable to the Lord, but proving things that are actually excellent in the Lord's sight. And it's when we have a discerning love, and so we're approving things that are excellent, that we go on to this goal or this result that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. So again, this idea of, okay, so how, you know, how, how can I live righteously? How can I live conformed to God's standards? Well, we need, we want a love that is growing in discernment so that we prove things that are excellent, so that we'll be filled with the fruits of righteousness. And of course, so much of this is related to what scripture says, to, de to determining that if scripture says it, that's what we will do. And again, abiding by the standard of, of scripture. Um, um, yesterday, my uh, boys were doing some work. They were um, using a a log splitter, this thing that uh, splits wood. Uh, people here in this area, some of them use wood stoves for heat during the winter, and uh, so they were they were splitting uh, wood. And uh, as they split the wood, the, the guy that they were splitting wood for, uh, he had told them, "Okay, this is about the size of wood piece of wood that I need for my for my uh, for my wood stove." And so we had a standard that. To, to follow, okay, I don't want it bigger than this, and I want it this size, or I want it smaller than this, and so as you would split a piece of wood, you would, you'd kind of look, look at it to see if it fit the standard, well, you know, some pieces come out, and you're like right on the edge, you know, okay, well, it's, it's not that much bigger, I mean, it's almost the same, it's definitely not smaller, and you have, you have to use, you have, you have to make a decision, and what we would often try to do in splitting that wood is if there was doubt, we would try to just split it again and make sure that it, it fit that maximum standard. And so we tried to give the benefit of a doubt to the standard that he had given us. And, uh, you know, I think in some ways we need to do that with God. You know, sometimes we come, we come to um, um, points of decision in our lives. Okay, what do I do? Uh, is this pleasing to God? Is this not pleasing to God? And uh, I think we need to give God the benefit of a doubt instead of coming to a decision point and saying, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. And we just kind of go with whatever we want or whatever's easier. Um, I think part of what Philippians 1 is encouraging us uh, to do is give God the benefit of the doubt. And uh, there are things that are excellent. There are things that are okay. There are things that are excellent. And what we really need is a love that is discerning, a love, uh, a love that loves things that matter. And when we come to decision points, we say, okay, so, you know, this, this could be acceptable. Is there, you know, is there anything that would be even better? 
and we just want to give God the benefit of, a, of the doubt. And uh, I have a number of points in that chapter on, on, righteous, on righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. And one of the things that I mention in that chapter is the example uh, from the life of, of Augustine, one of the early church fathers. And because when we talk about righteous behavior, really talking, it's really a, a wide scattershot in our lives of you're talking about righteous behavior really in all of our circumstances and all of our relationships. And I think sometimes we do want righteousness, but I think we don't always want it now. And uh, I think of the example of, again, this man, Augustine, uh, one of the church fathers, and before he was saved, uh, he was involved in, uh, well, he just was in some different immoral relationships. And he was burdened by his sin, but he felt chained by it. And on the one hand, he wanted out of this lifestyle he was in. On the other hand, he wanted to still enjoy the lifestyle that he was in. Uh, in. And so he, he found himself praying things like this, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. <laughs> make me pure, but not yet. And I thought of that so often because I think sometimes we feel the same way. Lord, make me pure, uh, but not yet. Make me righteous, but not yet. And too often we just want to enjoy our sin one more time. You know, we, we know we're in a relationship that, that is not right, but we want deliverance, but not yet. Um, we know some of the websites that we're accessing are, are not right. We want deliverance, but, but not yet. We want to just, you know, go there one more time. Um, we want deliverance from being lazy, but not yet. We want deliverance from resentment, but not yet. You know, we just want to make one more snide comment uh, to that person or uh, uh, justify ourselves one more time, and then we're going to put off that kind of unrighteous behavior. And, um, you know, sadly, we want to enjoy our sin a few more times before we put it away. And when, when we do that, we are opening ourselves up to be another, another casualty. And we need to look for God's enabling grace, to want his enabling grace, and to not make provision for, to fulfill the lust of our flesh anymore. Where we just say, okay, that's it. Uh, by God's grace, I'm going to go forward. I'm not going to plan to sin in this way any longer. And, and so, and, and righteousness really is protection. You know, we talk about how this armor um, is putting on the new man is like armor. And uh, it really is. I, I love this verse. Uh, and I put this in the book here. This is um, Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13, 6, I think is the right. Um, Proverbs 13, 6. And I'll just uh, read this here. Um, where it says, righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way. Or here's the, here's the New King James. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless. I like that word guard. And righteousness is a guard. It is a protection. It is armor. And to me, one of the outstanding examples of this is Daniel in the Old Testament. This man who his integrity his, his full-orbed uh, righteousness was a guard for him. I mean, when his enemies come after him, they can't find any area to attack other than his walk with God. Um, that, was, that was a protection uh, for him. And when we decide, you know, by God's grace, uh, I'm going to live out this new man I have in Christ Jesus, and uh, I'm going to attempt, by God's grace, to conform to the standard of what is acceptable and even what is excellent. And I'm going to try to do that in every area of my life. That is a guard. That is a protection. And then you've got this last thing uh, that I wanted to mention today. And this is the idea of the uh, in uh, back in Ephesians, uh, where you've got the feet shod with a preparation of the gospel of, of peace. And uh, as I mentioned, I like, let me just write this out here. 
So feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And this word preparation, another way that you could translate this is the idea of readiness. And it's the readiness that comes to us um, because of the peace that the gospel brings. And uh, in the book, I bring out two aspects of this. One, uh, one aspect is the idea of being ready, uh, ready for, for conflict. And the idea of the gospel of peace, this actually is something, if you wanted to, to study this a little bit more, what I would recommend is you look at Ephesians 2.11 and following, because that whole section really beginning in Ephesians 2.11 really tore all the, almost all the way to the end of chapter two. It's talking about the peace that the gospel brought us, that we were far away, but the gospel has now brought us near by the blood of Christ. We've been, we've been brought near and we've got both a peace with, uh, with the, with the Jews and we've got a peace with God and it, Brings, and it focuses on this idea of the peace that the gospel has brought us with God. And it's that peace that the gospel brings that gives us a readiness to, to battle, that we are ready to stand because we've got a firm footing. We know that we are at peace with God. And without that firm footing, without, that, um, without the, the readiness is okay, I know that the gospel has brought me peace with God. Without that readiness, we're not going to find ourselves standing firm in this, in this battle. So it really does, knowing how that gospel has brought us peace with God, that really does bring a firmness to our footing uh, and a readiness to stand in, in battle. But I think the second thing, when we think about the readiness that the gospel of peace brings, I don't think we can separate this from our duty to proclaim the gospel of peace. And the fact that the gospel has brought us peace with God really is what makes us ready to proclaim the gospel. You want to share what you have found in that gospel. And I, I think the fact that Paul uses imagery of feet you know you look at other passages and it talks about the feet how beautiful are the feet of those that bring that proclaim uh good tidings and i i just i can't help but think that paul uses foot imagery here because he has used it in other passages or other passages of scripture use the imagery of feet and they connect it with the idea of proclaiming proclaiming the good news of the gospel. And so part of, part of our feet shod with the, with the readiness that the gospel uh, brings, a gospel that brought us peace brings, um, part of that is uh, this idea that we are ready to proclaim that gospel. And there ought to be a readiness in our hearts because of the peace that that gospel has brought. And uh, in the book, I, I mention uh, an example of this man, uh, William Burns. And uh, William Burns became a missionary to China. And uh, in fact, he, uh, he worked with Hudson Taylor for a while. And then just providentially, God separated them. And uh, they actually had planned to work together for years. And in the providence of God, they ended up going in two different directions due uh, purely to circumstances, but I think it was, it was God at work. But um, anyway, William Burns was a very faithful missionary in China, just like Hudson Taylor. He's not as well known, but um, he, he was very burdened for the unsaved, even as a child. And um, uh, one of the stories that comes out of his life is uh, one time when I guess he grew up in a very small uh, town in um, Scotland. And uh, one day he went with his mother uh, to the big city. And uh, there in the big city, there were all these people. And as he looked at all these people in this big city, um, he found himself burdened for these people. In fact, his mom had to go looking for him and found him crying. And she's like, why are you crying? And uh, he made this comment. He said he was crying over the thud of Christless feet on the way to hell. 
uh, the thud, I'm gonna put this in the chat, the thud of Christless feet on the way to hell. And, uh, you know, I thought of this and um, I've thought of how, you know, the next time uh, you're in a, a market or a grocery store, or you're in a, a hawker center, um, or you're on the subway, um, and you hear the sound of feet of people walking. Think of think of this statement of William Burns, Burns, the thud of Christless feet on the way to hell. And think of that. Try to hear the sound of their feet in that context. And I think thinking of that, and then thinking of the of the gospel that brought you peace. Think of how far away we as Gentiles were from God and how that gospel brought us peace so that we are co-heirs with Jews in the one body of Christ, that we are at absolute peace with God, that actually we are now his dwelling place through the spirit of God. We are his dwelling place. And think of what you now enjoy and think of the, of the destiny of those who are without Christ and meditating on that will give us a readiness, a readiness to share that gospel that brought us peace with God. So these are the first three of these pieces of armor that Paul will single out as we try to put on uh, the new man or put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The idea of truth, being truthful in what we are and what we say. The idea of righteousness, conforming to the standards that what are acceptable and even excellent in the sight of God. And then this idea of the readiness that the gospel of peace brings, uh, knowing the peace of knowing right with God the, and the confidence that it gives us in the battle. And then as well, um, uh, the readiness it gives to us to proclaim uh, that gospel of peace. And so I hope that as we as we move forward uh, in our day, even tomorrow, as we rest our pillow tonight, that uh, we will take courage to by God's strength to put on the whole armor and then to stand and not back down from truth, not back down from righteousness, not back down from the readiness the gospel of peace uh, brings, but be ready uh, to do, to be everything that Christ intended for his body uh, to be. So may, uh, may the Lord uh, bless and use these words to, to provoke us uh, to love and good work. So anybody have any uh, comments or uh, thoughts that might be of help to us as we think about this passage? Okay, we got a, a good, good question here. Um, this idea of giving God the benefit of a doubt. And uh, thank you for this um, clarification. Um, yeah, I do not in any way mean to reduce God's status to man. So the, the, in the chat here, what she's saying is, you mentioned giving God the benefit of the doubt. Are we reducing God's status to man? For example, God said, be ye holy for I am holy. We should take God at his word and believe he is holy and not giving him the benefit of a doubt that he is holy. And, and um, that's a good, a, good, a good clarification. Yeah, what, I'm, what I mean, by, um, what I mean by, God, by our giving God the benefit of, benefit of, of the doubt, what I, what I mean by that is that has nothing to do with his being holy. Um, you're exactly right. He is holy. But the idea is that if we've got a situation where we have something that maybe uh, could be questionable, rather than just assume that that's okay because we want it to be, maybe taking the higher road and abstaining or avoiding it. And that's what I mean by giving God the benefit of a doubt is, is not just trying to say, well, I think it's okay but asking ourselves, okay, is it excellent? Is it really acceptable to him? 
uh, maybe to, uh, let's see, what can we give a little more specific example? Maybe uh, let's say it's a, a movie. And um, you know we we like the th we like the theme we like the actors it's funny, um, but let's say there's a scene that depicts immorality or encourages immorality, and we think to ourselves, well, you know, but it has a good overall theme, um, and it's funny, and everybody likes it. And you say, but you know, God is very much against immorality. And you say, okay, I'm going to, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there's enough good that it overrides the problem, but um, I'm going to give God the benefit of the doubt. And I'm going to say, no, this is off limits for a, for a believer. And I'm not sure that's a good example, because <laughs> I would say if something encourages immorality, that's clear. That that is not food for a believer. So, I, but I hope that, that that's what I mean by giving God the benefit of a doubt. I don't mean in any way are we doubting that He is holy. What I mean is that if if there is a choice that we have, that what we want to do is take the high road, not the low road, and that's that's what I mean. Is that is that helped? Is that clear? I appreciate that 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 thought there. Um, I guess I just feel like sometimes it's easy for us as believers to live life the lowest common denominator, you know, to put it in math terms, you know, that would say, okay, here's a clear list of do's and don'ts, and I'm going to avoid those. But sometimes when it comes to exercising discernment, we don't really want to exercise too much discernment, because that's going to mean we have to live too careful of a Christian life. <laughs> um, and I think that's what God wants. Uh, our joy should be in him and uh, not in things that put us right on the border of things that maybe maybe would not be pleasing uh, to the Lord. So that's a good thank you. Thank you, Sister Lily, for that, for that question and thought. So here's uh, uh, in the chat from uh, Brother Uchai, readiness to preach the gospel. Do you think that preaching the gospel necessitates proving that man had broken the laws of God before sharing the gospel as the only way to peace through Jesus Christ? And yeah, no, that's a good question. And I, I, I would say yes. I would say that you know, in some ways you've got to show people that they are not at peace so that you can um, explain how the gospel brings that peace. And um, so under, you know, really helping people to, to see their brokenness or feel that brokenness. And uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's important. That's a good, that's a good reminder. And, you know, sometimes asking questions helps. I remember talking to somebody who was witnessing to a Buddhist and uh, he mentioned that one of the things that he does is often ask questions and because uh, he'll say, you know, are you, are you, are you doing, you know, are you living a, a good life? Oh yes, I'm living a good life. Yeah. Well, tell me about your living the good life, and you know, try to get a few specifics. And so, well, are are you really, are you really treating people the way you would want to be treated? Are you really being unselfish? And he said, the more questions he asks, uh, the more the other person will realize, you know, I'm actually not, <laughs> I'm not living up to my own standard of goodness. And he does that to try to expose their, you know, their sinfulness, which is the first step towards somebody saying, okay, you're right. I need help. I need a savior. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not at peace with God. So um, here's a question from Sister Joy. As soon as we want to prove what is excellent, but it may be extreme. How can we balance that or avoid, uh, avoid extremity? And um and that's a good question. I think part of that is just we've got to um, we've got to go back to scripture and just make sure it really is moored 
in what God says. Uh, and I think part of that is, part of this is making sure that our conscience is scripturally bound, not just, um, not just bound by maybe what, what, what other people do, uh, but really, really making sure that our conscience is scripturally bound. Uh, but, you know, the honest truth is sometimes, and maybe the more our culture uh, gets further and further away from God's creational norms, uh, I think maybe there will be ways in which we seem more and more extreme. <laughs> um, uh, but I, th I think the importance is that we are, our, 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 our conscience is bound to scripture. And um, but yeah, if you remember in the Old Testament, the, the prophets sometimes one of the uh, one of the comments that somebody makes in the Old Testament is, yeah, here's one of these madmen, <laughs> and the idea was this guy was so under the control of of God's spirit that uh, they just are these prophets were so under the control of God's spirit that sometimes they just seem a little bit crazy. I'm not saying we should be considered crazy, but there is a radical devotion to Christ. Uh, that I think is right for believers. And I think as people get to know us more and more, they, they ought to feel like, wow, this person, um, this person is really religious, is the way they would put it, you know, wow, this person really believes what they believe. And I think there's a, a there's a good side to that. There's a natural side to that, that we should just be so gods, that is painfully obvious. Um, but I think what, what really helps us is making sure that we're not just being extreme to be extreme, but we are, our conscience is bound to scripture. And if you've got something you're debating, you say, okay, what, you know, okay, what does scripture say? And really wrestling through it until you come to a point of faith about it. And I think Romans brings us up, Romans 14, I think it is, said, whatever is not of faith is sin. And it really gives the, gives the freedom to every believer to wrestle things through. And I just think many believers don't wrestle things through. You know, I think many, for many of us, me, me included, I think we, um, we, we tend to, I think we have two extremes, maybe to use the word extreme. <laughs> I think we have two extremes. I think the one extreme is we don't wrestle things through. And we just say, okay, what, is every, what are other Christians doing? And we just say, well, if they do it, it must be okay. And many times we will choose the, the level of Christian that matches what we want to do. Well, they do that at that church. You know, they have that kind of music at that church. Uh, they watch those kind of movies at that church. You know, they get to do that at that church. And so we just kind of choose a level that we like and helps us fit in. And I think sometimes we don't really think through our Christianity. I think that's one extreme. I think the other extreme um, is that we could... Um, maybe base our conscience on just whatever we think, or maybe, uh, you know, and, and not saying, okay, what does God say? And so I think really just trying to be bound by scripture and wrestling through uh, scripture and saying, okay, what does God say about this? And coming to a point of faith and forming a conviction. And then based on that, living out a uh, commitment. And uh, just to give a quick uh, example here. I see some more stuff coming out here. Uh, but like, for example, when I was, when I was in a college in graduate school, I really came to the conviction that I wanted to honor the Lord's day. And it's like, I wanted the Lord's day to be different. So I, I came to a conviction about that. And so I thought, okay, what am I going to, I said, okay, what am I going to do is I'm not going to do my studies on the Lord's day. I'm going to honor the Lord's day. I'm going to use the Lord's day to encourage myself in the Lord. And so I'm not going to do my studying on the Lord's day. If I have something to do on Monday, I either finish it Saturday night or I get up early Monday morning and I finish it. Now, that was my personal conviction. Okay, I'm not, I'm not binding. I'm not putting that on other people's consciences. But that was, I just, I came to a point of faith and I thought, okay, by God's grace, he can give me, he can give me the help I need to honor the Lord's day, to set it apart and to do my work on other days. So that's it's kind of an example. And that may seem extreme. Somebody says, I can't, you know, um, but that was just, that was my conviction based on my understanding of scripture at that point in my life. I want to honor the Lord's day. How can I practically uh, do that? Uh, okay, here's a um, from 
um, you can see in here. Um, however, some of us are not familiar with the scripture. We prefer yes or no answer to our question, resulting in us being labeled as legalistic. Oh, I'm sorry, this is from Brother um, Kok Singh. Um, yeah, um, and I think I think I, I I think it is very easy for us to to want a yes or a no, and and sometimes we may need that. And I think what we want to do is we want to grow in our knowledge of Scripture, obviously. And I think it's a difference between like a baby, you know, when your kids are young, and they ask you questions, you just say yes or no, you know, you say no, <laughs> yeah. And then they get to a certain age and they say, well, why, <laughs> you know, and. And at a certain point in that, if the question is asked correctly, there is a time to kind of explain why. Well, why? Well, because this is what we believe. This is what scripture says. And you start to explain the why. And I think as we mature in Christ, we, you know, we get past just those yes and no's and we want to know scripture. So I would say, okay, let's say we're not familiar with scripture. One of the things we could do is ask people who maybe we think no more scripture and ask them and say, okay, what are some passages I could consider? And, uh, and so like, for example, you could say, um, okay, what, um, let's say what would be an example? Maybe um, let's say uh, music, let's say. Uh, and you say, well, I don't know what the Bible says about music. Well, I kind of feel the same way. Yeah, I say, well, okay, well, you know, is there somebody who has studied music scripturally and could give me some scriptures that I could consider and give me some help in that matter? Um, it could be uh, modesty and dress. Um, it could be something like um, abortion or homosexuality. And we say, okay, so what would be passages? Um, it could be something like, say, smoking. He says, well, there's no verses that talk about smoking in the Bible. Um, well, okay, what would be, and you, you ask another believer, what would be some, what would be some passages that I would consider as I think about an issue like smoking or like drinking alcoholic beverages? And so what you would try to do is, is try to solicit, solicit scriptures that would help in making a, a decision. And so by, by building your knowledge of scripture, you're building your discernment level. So I, I know, I hope that, I hope that um, is helpful. Uh, proving what is acceptable uh, under the Lord. Can you share more specifically how one can prove to himself that is that it is acceptable? So I would, I would say that if I, I'm looking here at this uh, passage again, this is from Ephesians uh, 5.10. And I would say, Okay, so the focus is, is, is it acceptable to the Lord? So how would I know whether something is acceptable to the Lord? And the only answer to that would be based on what God has revealed. And it really takes me back to scripture. And I don't want to be overly, overly simplistic, but it takes us back to scripture that really the only way I can know whether it's acceptable to the Lord is based on what God has revealed. And it does, I think it does bring up this issue of, of, of discernment where there are things where we do not have like a clearly stated verse, like you should not watch this television program or maybe you should not smoke. But I think what that ought to do is that ought to push us as believers to say, okay, so maybe I don't have an easy yes or no verse. But what I do have is I have a Bible that has revealed my God. What does my Bible reveal about my God? What does it reveal about his ways, about the way he thinks? What does it reveal about what holiness means? And you try to go to scripture looking at it from that angle, what does the Bible reveal about my God and his ways, about what is righteous, what is ethical, about what is holy, about what is immoral? And you let what God has revealed as uh, determine what is acceptable. Um, so, uh, you know, let's say, for example, uh, let me just get myself into trouble. How about that? 
Um, so let's say, for example, Ephesians 5, 3, and 4. So fornication, all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become the saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient or are not appropriate. So when I read those verses, here's what I, here's what I come away with, that God's level, what's acceptable to God is no fornication, no uncleanness, no covetousness, no filthiness, no foolish talking, no jesting. So for example, uh, how many inappropriate jokes should I tell before it's displeasing to the Lord? How many inappropriate jokes should I make a part of my regular entertainment? That would be a pleasing to the Lord. How, how much of of what I digest personally that leads me to covetousness, how much of that is acceptable to the Lord? And see, I would say the answer is none. What God wants is no foolish talking, no uncleanness, no immorality, no covetousness. So I would say if there are things in my life, things that I, I am entertained by, or things that I allow into my life that are encouraging me to any covetousness or any uncleanness, maybe I need to cut that out of my life because God's standard is none. That's, that's what's acceptable to the Lord. So that's, you know, that, that's, that's what I would, I would, I would say. And uh, I mean, it, it gets, I mean, it gets broader than just, I'm, I'm bringing up do's and don'ts, but um, for example, even this morning, I was helped. Uh, we're out of time here, but I was helped this morning. Here's an example, for example, like, like, you know, I've got decisions to make about where I go and what I do. And um, so I'm reading in Philippians 1 this morning, and I'm reading how Paul says, okay, I've got two options. I can die or I can stay <laughs> uh, in order to be of help. And um, he says, you know, I could die and that would be better, but I think staying here is more needful for you. So that's my plan. My plan is to stay here. <laughs> and, and what I thought is, okay, here's what that tells me, that in, as I make plans and I say, okay, should I do this or should I do this? That part of, you know, part of what is acceptable God, what, you know, part of a thinking behavior that is acceptable to God is thinking of it this way. What, what would be more of service to the body of Christ? So would it be more of service to the body of Christ if I go here or if I go there? And asking that kind of a question is rooted in, for example, what I just read this morning. I think, okay, yeah, Paul's right. It's not just about me. It's not just about what would be more comfortable. You know, yeah, Paul says, yeah, I'd rather just die and go to heaven. I mean, that'd be far better, but you know, you, you need help. So okay. So as I think about my movements, and what I should do, okay, what would be of more service to the body of Christ or to my fellow man? And so that's, that's a way to let scripture guide our decisions or guide our thinking. Um, so here's another, uh, some Christians may not, may not even ask, is this acceptable to the Lord? They do not see it as questionable, what other Christians do. And see, I would say, yes, um, I, I, would, I, I agree with you. And I think that's I think that's one I think that's one flaw or one weakness is I think sometimes I think I think we don't really weigh things I think and I think part of it is we're are we are all creatures of our culture and I think many times we just drift along with our culture and we just assume that it must be okay because my culture does it and I think part of being gods is there are different points in our life when we kind of wake up. And we say, "Whoa, I'm not sure if that really is right." And remember when I, I remember when I got right with God, uh, you know, there were things I was like, "Wow, I don't think that's right." Um, and I think there's a sensitivity hmm. to God as you sacrifice, as you begin to really walk with God. And and I think in theory, right? In theory, as we as we walk in the light, I think in theory our lives. This may sound kind of funny, but I think in theory. 
our lives, in a sense, there may be, you know, it, it may be a life that is increasingly different from the culture around us, the more we walk in the light. Um, and as we walk with God. And so I, I agree. I think, I think sometimes I think, and to me, that's part of what, for example, I think separates, if I can put it this way, what I think separates evangelicalism or new evangelicalism from fundamentalism or separatism, which I'm a part of fundamentalism. I think JSM is a part of fundamentalism and separatism. And uh, when you look at new evangelicalism and fundamentalism, you know, we believe essentially all the same doctrines, you know, the virgin birth of Christ, at least, you know, conservative evangelicals. But I think one of the differences that separates us from them or makes us different is I think it's, it goes back, somebody mentioned earlier, first Peter chapter one, be holy in every aspect of your conversation, be holy in every aspect of your lifestyle. And I think part of what we as a movement, what we bring to the body of Christ, I think is this idea of, I want to bring every aspect of my life under the surveillance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm not gonna assume that just because my culture does it means that it is okay. I'm going to, I want every aspect of my life to reflect the character of my God, the holiness of my God. And I think that's part of what ought to, um, ought to characterize our movement. And I think one of the things that people point at, and then when they accuse, you know, and they look at our movement, is I think sometimes we have focused on the big do's and don'ts, like we don't drink, we don't go to movies, we don't listen to certain kinds of music. And I think sometimes we have excused other kinds of behavior, like anger, or, you know, marital conflict, or other things like that. We said, well, you know, bless God, I don't drink, you know, but our spirit is not right um, in some of our relationships, and we're not living in love. And I think what we need to do is say, okay, all of, I want every area of my life to reflect the holiness of God. That includes my relationship. That includes the way I treat my children. That includes the way I treat my wife. That includes the way I treat my church members. But just because I'm a pastor doesn't give me the right to browbeat people or bully people. Um, I mean, we're talking every area of my life. And that's because God is God. And God says, love me with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your might, all of your strength. There's nobody else on earth I'm to love with everything I have. But God is God, and he deserves everything. 